So, Sheikh, uh, you yes. mentioned that, uh, that the first view was the majority view. Um, yes. That's the majority view among Shias or among Muslims in general? Even if you look at the most prominent Mufassirin, if you look at, for example, Sheikh Al-Tabrasi in Majma'ul Bayan, he seems inclined to believe at least the first few verses he believes that this is a reference to Jibra'il. Of course, you know his style is to kind of give the different interpretations, but he seems inclined to believe that the vision was in reference to Jibra'il, that is also a reference to Jibra'il. But if you look at, for example, Tafsir al-Burhan by, uh, by Al-Allam al-Bahrani, which is a hadith-based tafsir, he favors the other view. Because I mean, he shares all of them, but knowing him and his style, he seems to favor the, uh, the view that the, the, the Allama who shadid al-Quwa is not Jibra'il. Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi in Tafsir al-Amthal doesn't believe that these verses are talking about Jibra'il. And I agree with him. I think that given the status of the Prophet, given the importance, the, the insignificance of the Prophet seeing Jibra'il in his actual form and dedicating so many of, the, of these verses to that encounter between the Prophet and Jibra'il, I, I, I would agree with Sheikh Nasan Makarim Shirazi that from the beginning to you know, uh, the end of the verse that I, sh I shared with you, that this is about the Prophet encountering God. Um, thank you. And also in uh, verse 9, when it says that he was a distance of two bows away, or, or even nearer than that. So what, what's the significance of saying, like, he's, he's even nearer than that? Because that seems to give, like, two different, like, gives one distance, says, no, actually, he's even less than that. What's you, so you're saying that why so what would be a, what would be a better so you're saying why even mention the two bow lengths right so what would what would be a because because as I mentioned this was this was a standard of measure by the Arabs so you're using something that is uh, that signifies proximity that is familiar to your audience and you're saying that you know that 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 measurement of proximity that you're familiar with. It's even closer than that. So it's a way to make the audience understand that the nearness of the Prophet is something that is even closer than you can imagine. Because again, you know, we're using physical instruments to describe, you know, a metaphysical encounter. So there's, so no matter what language you use, you're not going to be able to fully describe the closeness of that uh, that encounter, and Allah knows best. The, the the ulama really don't dedicate, from what I have seen, a lot of discussion as to why, you know, Qaba Qawsain is used and why 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 is it also qualified by O Edna? Yeah. What I have what I have seen that is that it's a standard of measurement among the Arabs, and I also mentioned that some of the ulama see this as you know, representing the circle of creation that, you know, the Holy Prophet is, you know, right? That the Prophet is the medium of divine grace. So when Allah creates, it goes through the Prophet. And even the, uh, the return to God, that this entire existence, it, it only functions through the medium of the Prophet. Because he's wasata tul fayl, he's the medium of divine grace. That the return to God is meaningless without the personality of the Holy Prophet, because he is essentially the benchmark that all of the mukallafin are aiming at. It's it's kind of like, can you measure anything if you don't have a unit of measurement? For example, if you want to build something that's 24 inches you're never going to get it exactly 24.000 to infinity you're going to get it maybe 
But in order for you to even get that, you have to have the perfect measurement. You have to have that 24 inches, 24.000. So with that, that perfect measurement, nothing else can be used to, to basically aim at that. Do you, you see what, what I mean? Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because, like, I guess I was thinking along the lines of, um, because it says, hey, you're using two bows lens, which is showing that you're very close, but at the same time also implying a certain level of distance. Because otherwise, you want to be really close, you could say, hey, one bow lens, or it's probably a smaller unit of measurement. Yeah. Allahu Adam. I mean, I, I can't comment further than that because otherwise it'll just be, you know, a regimen that will be a total guess. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Sheikh, um, there yes. were discussions going uh, around about uh, the mirage of the Holy Prophet. And a lot of them, they say that, uh, you know, was it physical or was it spiritual? What do you say about it? I mean, if you look at the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, they say that this was a spiritual and a bodily experience. You know, because the, the 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 narrations, the statements of the Ahlul Bayt mention bibadenik uh, that this is a spiritual and a bodily experience. So it's not that just the soul of the Prophet experienced this. That this is this was a physical and a bodily ascension. So how do you we explain this is reference? Things, uh, Say that again. How do we explain to the non-Muslims? How can you explain to the non-Muslims that that such such a thing is possible? Yes. Why why would we why would we be compelled to explain that this is possible? There's if they ask if they ask questions about Mirage, a lot of them they do ask. So you know uh, how to explain. My my, my response my response would be very simple: hmm. that there are a lot of things about the universe that we don't understand. And this is perhaps one of them. Just because we don't have a scientific way of explaining how someone with their physical body can experience such an ascension. You know, you ask them, what is dark energy? Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things about the universe that they don't know. So they're really not in any position to say that this is not possible. Yeah, it's not possible based on your limited knowledge. Okay. But perhaps again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, if he wishes for his servant, his most beloved servant, to ascend and witness the dominion of his kingdom with his body and his soul, he's able to do that. Whether we can understand the mechanism or not, he's able to do it. Assalamualaikum, Sheikh. Um, I have a question Assalamu regarding the uh, why uh, Hazrat Jibreel actually said that if I go beyond this point, I will be burned. What was what's the significance of you know the word burning? Why didn't he just say I'm not allowed? No. Ihtarakt, you know, could mean that it could just signify that. You know, it's not that, you know, it's one thing. I'll give you an example just to illustrate what I mean. If I, if I put a sign on a door in, the, in my house and I say that you're not allowed to go into this room, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not, a, I, I'm not allowed to, but I could, if I wanted to, open the door and go inside the room, right? Jibra'il, when he says, if I go beyond this limit, I will burn, it's not, it's not that he's saying that I'm not allowed to, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to give me the green light, I'd be able to go. He's trying to explain that I cannot. I, I, I don't have the ability to even venture into that world because I don't have the spiritual rank you know, when you look at Jannah, for example, Jannah has levels. The people on the lower levels of Jannah, 
are not able to go to the higher levels because their existence cannot handle it. So it's not that Jibra'i, you know, he sees a sign and it's a stop and he says, I can't go because of the sign. He can't go because his, his being cannot handle what is beyond that limit. So when he says that if I take, if I go a little bit beyond this limit, I will burn, it means that my being cannot handle, you know, the spiritual pressure, if I want to use that word, that exists in that realm. So it's almost like another example is if your lungs are not trained, you can't go, if you don't have the right equipment, you can't climb Mount Everest, right? You need oxygen tanks, you have to get, you have to climatize your body to be able to go up the mountain. You in your current state with your current lungs are not able to go up, not because you saw a sign and you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna obey the rules. Physically, you can't handle it. Do you see the difference? Excellent. So there's an, there's an existential limitation. It's not that Jibra'il is just following a rule. Even if he wanted to, he cannot go. Thank you, Sheikh. Excellent, Sheikh. Excellent reply. MashaAllah. Example also. Excellent, MashaAllah. Uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum, assalam. I had a question about the topic, uh, you know, about the tafsir. Um, yes. Uh, there have been some hadiths uh, regarding this uh, miraj, you know, where it says that um, by the time the Prophet uh, completed the entire miraj, like the water from his wudu had not yet dried. So it all happened in a very short time. So are we to understand from that that the miraj happened outside of the normal space-time dimension that we understand? Or did Allah slow down the time so that the entire miraj happened in what would have been just a few seconds? You know, there, there's really no way for us to know with certainty. You know, what we do know is that, you know, this, this experience, this ascension happened, you know, in a in a single night, and it happened in a very short amount of time. But we don't know if if this took place in a realm where there is no, you know, time factor, or there was a type of, uh, you know, uh, manipulation of the. Uh, of the time uh, space continuum you know it would I, whatever answer i give you it would be a total total guess but uh you know we, we really don't know this is one of the the asrar one of the mysteries i, I don't want to like go off topic but you know there's uh some related hadiths talk about you know that uh that I mean, not only for Allah, but for many of his chosen beings and, you know, elevated entities. Like, there is no concept of space and time, right? Everything is, like, happening at, at the same time. Yeah. It's all one. They can see, like, the future and past and present is all kind of commingled. So is, is, is that something where, you know, back to your point of earlier where you said that, you know, that if Allah wants, he can make it possible. Of course, of course. I mean, we have we have even examples from the lives of the imams, where you know this idea of of tayul arf takes place. Like you know, for example, Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam buries Salman al Farisi. You know, where the Imam alayhi salam is in one part of the Arabian Peninsula, and Salman al Farisi, you know, uh, you know, passes away, and Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam attends the funeral, prays over him, and he returns to his, uh, to his residence within a few seconds. So we have, we have examples of this taking place among awliyaullah, among, among the prophets. So it's, you know, the, the ability to kind of, uh, you know, 
I don't want to use the word manipulate the time and space continuum, but there is definitely an ability there among these chosen personalities to kind of break beyond the limits of time and space. You know, and even, you know, you know, this idea of, uh, of, of wormholes in, uh, in physics, you know, perhaps this could be even used to, to possibly explain some of these occurrences in, you know, on Earth. Like, I mean, uh, you know, when you were talking about the uh, incident of Mola Ali, uh, you know, uh, it, it kind of, it's almost uh, like he uh, illustrated Heisenberg's uncertainty principle where, you know, two particles can exist simultaneously, at, you know, in different locations. Uh, yeah. So it's like, and he's the only one who actually manifested that in reality. Yeah. Very true. Very possible. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for the insight. And uh, Shit, there's uh, one question that someone's asking online. Asking, uh, how does Jerusalem come into a mirage? And is it from the Quran? So Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, if you go to Surah Al-Isra, Surah Al-Isra indicates that the night journey took place from Mecca because you know this this occurred during the Meccan period so Allah says subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram which is in Mecca ila al masjid al aqsa which is in Jerusalem alladhi barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina so the last part of this verse is a reference to the mi'raj li yuriyahu min ayatina so the night journey, the Isra, is from Mecca to Jerusalem. The Mi'raj, at least from what I recall, it seems to have taken place from Masjid al-Aqsa to the heavens. And then this is this is where the you know the Prophet sees the different levels of the heavens, and then this uh this encounter takes place of Fadana Fatadalla. I had one more question that uh, the day of Mad'at and the day of Mi'raj are the same day? Now, according to what I have read, it seems, according to, to what I've read from, from different commentaries, is that some have said that Mi'raj happened possibly twice. That as we'll see, and inshallah, I'll speak about this as we go on with the with the other verses. That you know, Mi'raj took place more than once, possibly twice. But uh, this uh, this Isra, as far as we know, it only happened once. The journey from Mecca to Jerusalem was uh, happened once. Now, did it happen in the same night? You know, again, we have to we have to be careful when we when we use you know words like night because night can explain the journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, right? Because that still took place on Earth, and Earth is governed, you know, by uh, by you know the laws of you know time and space. But Mi'raj, we don't know. We can't really use the word. You know, not because again, this we're talking about a different realm, different plane of existence. But it seems that the Prophet returned from the Mi'raj on the same night. But as I said, some have said that it, it happened twice. And Allah knows best. Beyond more beyond that, I'm not sure. Uh, Sheikh, uh, did Ba'asad? And Mi'raj happened on the same day, same night. There, there's a dispute about uh, about the date of uh, of Bi'tha and uh, and Mi'raj. Some have said that Mi'raj took place in uh, in the month of Ramadan. I believe is one opinion. 
and uh, the dates, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure about the dates. I do know that, we know that it happened once for sure. Some narrations indicate that it may have happened a second time. But as for the, the specific dates, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Allah bless you. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much. Please keep me in your du'a. And may Allah protect you, give you a very, very long life. And all the other Thank you so much. Jazakumullah. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum.